ladies and gentlemen, please thrilled to share with you some periodic table poems or bonuses in the Down in the Dirt. Check it out. July 2022 issue is volume 197 called History, Banners and Flags. These are actually pictures from the Flight 93 Memorial from where the flight crashed after 9-11. So, anywho, I hope you find that cool. Anyway, um, I'd like to share with you a few of these poems and I'm going to scroll through and find... Ah, some elements poems because there'll be bonuses after prose stories in here. This first one is called Hydrogen 3, Glow for Me. A black plastic watch and glowing dials. Looks like a toy, even with tritium in it. The radioactivity is no big deal, or that tritium is used making a hydrogen bomb because it's a history is good for a play watch too. <laughs> if you're gonna have bad things and good things, why not, you know? This next one is hydrogen laced with pie. A particle physicist at the University of Rochester taught lessons on how to use the variation principle quantum mechanical technique to get energy states of a hydrogen atom. In doing this, they found the Wallace formula for pi. It was the first time pi was found in physics in the hydrogen atom. There is an image that goes along with that poem as well. It's impossible to see in this light in this book, so you can check it out online. Um, but this next one I want to share with you is a poem titled Hydrogen Cyanide. He was once a college chemistry professor, so he hoped he was a shoe-in to work with the Waffen SS. He ended up working at the Bundeswehrkopf's, a, a Berlin radio station broadcasting Nazi propaganda. But after his university was bombed, he took what he could get and was grateful for work. And that didn't require him to use a gun. But when the science and research department at the Reich Main Security Office gave him orders to go to the Dachau concentration camp to retrieve paperwork, he solemnly went home to pack for his two-day trip, driving there one day, returning home the next. He had seen the Sassenhausen concentration camp 35 kilometers north of Berlin, but Sassenhausen was more of a training center for Schutzhelfers officers before the SS men were sent overseas for the, to other camps. And although Dachau was small, it was essentially the first and set the standard for all of Hitler's camps. He felt the tension knot in his stomach grow even before saying goodbye to his wife and two children. Arriving at the camp the next afternoon, he learned the lieutenant general was away from his office, so he could only get the necessary paperwork the next morning, which left him alone at the camp in a stranger's office. He paced. A part of him didn't want to go out there. He, he, there was safety inside of these office walls. Here, he could remain separate from the war. After nearly an hour of pacing, he decided to just get it over with, face it, get it over with, go out there. And when he stepped outside, the air felt heavy. He could feel the weight of the move he made, the weight of his legs grew heavier. He dragged his feet, making his way to the open walkway. Although there was that heavy haze in the air, he knew that chemical reactions had occurred to leave that distinct smell in the smoke and haze working its way through the air. He saw across the clearing doors close to the showers. So he walked with a determination to bring himself to the hall. He could hear the sounds of people inside grow louder, and he then caught a glimpse of a guard that just made his way to the roof. As he got closer, he watched the soldier open what looked like a can and then shake it into the vents at the center of the building before closing the vent and walking across the roof 
before taking the ladder back down. From the moment anything from that can made its way into that building, with every subsequent step he took, he could hear the wails and screams get louder and louder from the Jews inside. And he stopped for a moment. Look, he thought. He knew what this was. Get used to this. It was all he could think to himself to get his heavy feet moving again. He caught the soldier walking down the ladder from the building and quickened his pace to catch him before he got far from the building. And not able to see the ranking on his uniform shirt, he quickened his pace to not yell for the soldier. With the soldier still holding the jar in his hand, he asked if he could see the can. Once he held it in his hands, he looked at all the elements on the label, Zyklon B, hydrogen cyanide. He knew this poisonous liquid boiled just below room temperature, just above room temperature. So he knew that all they had to do was drop some from a sealed can in the open hall, poisoning thousands in only 20 minutes. He knew the Germans first thought of using this prussic acid against Napoleon in 1813, and if they had, it would have been the first time hydrogen cyanide was used in warfare. But look at him now, the chemistry professor, reduced, reduced to thinking of how, of all of the Jews, how they inhaled this bitter shroud of smell of hydrogen cyanide until it bombarded and it combined with the air in their blood cells, causing death from oxygen starvation. He suddenly felt like he needed to take a deep breath to get more of that oxygen, as much of that oxygen as he could. He saw the blue stains on the concrete walls, then walked back to the soldier to give him the empty can. When the soldier, when the soldier making small talk said, one of the older Jews pleaded with me, I'm a, dis a decorated war veteran. <laughs> World War II, I was in, air artillery, in the air artillery battalion. We shot gas shells at the British and Americans. I shouldn't be here. My paperwork is still with my luggage. And they just kept telling him to go into the showers. And he knew in World War II, we shot those shells into trenches in France. So he shrugged and gave a slight grin to commiserate with the soldier. But he knew that everyone fights their own battles in this war. He was only a lieutenant, a lower ranking attaché than the colonel who sent him on this job. But he still held rank over the soldier. So he told the soldier that once there were no screams inside, that they were to open up the doors and bring everyone to the crematorium. He wanted to be notified when he walked away at 50 meters. He clutched his pockets to find his cigarettes and lighter. He wanted anything to calm him down and that would help him focus on anything else until it was time. He stood at the field, chain-smoking, until he heard the running footsteps in the distance. He looked at his pocket watch. Twenty minutes had passed, and he saw a soldier running toward him. He looked at the gas chamber, and he saw that they had opened the doors. So he started his methodical walk back to where he was destined to go. He acknowledged the soldier with a wave and quickened his pace to the building. He saw a few different soldiers this time, all waiting until a cloud of gas was cleared from the chamber so they could work. He walked to that doorway. It was a dark, but he could make out a pyramid of bodies toward that small, now closed opening in the center. From what he could tell, they looked like they were all, all tossing their babies and small children toward the top in an effort to keep their children alive. One of the soldiers passed him 
as he turned. So he asked him how long he had been doing this. Nearly a year, he answered. So he had to ask in doing this, if seeing this bothered him. The man only answered, if you do something long enough, you get used to anything. With that, he nodded slightly and knew that he had sought enough and he walked away. Early the next morning, he came back to his office he came back to his office at the Dachau concentration camp so that he could get the necessary paperwork and quickly as possible get away so that he can get out of there. And the, the tension not grew smaller in his stomach the closer he got back to his home in the, in the drive. But when he came to his house, he saw his wife sitting outside their home with the windows open. Once he actually got there close enough, he asked her what was going on, and he saw her coughing and sounding more and more hoarse. With each step, he wanted to hold her, but concern overtook him, and she explained that she had just used a pesticide fumigant throughout the house and that she could no longer breathe while inside those walls. He looked at the second floor of the house for the children, and she told him that they were staying at the night at a friend's house. And suddenly, he imagined the fumigant that's killing the vermin inside of their home. Hydrogen cyanide was now in their home. The form of Zyphon B was now in their home. And she was trying, all she was trying to do was kill the vermin, and he thought of the propaganda minister he now worked with telling the nation to believe that the Jews are the rats, the Jews are the vermin. So he looked at the home and asked her if they could get out of here tonight as far as they possibly could. He held her close before they walked away, holding hands. That was way too deep that I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna leave you on a hefty note. So ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, enjoy your creativity. Enjoy your freedom now that COVID is slowly coming to an end. Enjoy the cafe. Went to Cafe Aloha, where this open mic from the Cafe Gallery originated. Um, stay safe, stay creatively inclined. Um, stay reading Down in the Dirt and CCD magazines from Scars Publications. And I look forward to hearing from each and every one of you very, very soon. Thank you all so very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lincoln thanks you. Lincoln thanks you. <laughs>